Okay, um weiter zu sehen, Ray, ich hoffe, ihr ist gut heute im Marathon von Prinz Esther, die ich improvisiert habe, Ray von B. Schwartelt. Wir haben Leis bei der Fünf. Just to give you a highlight of the end of things, we have a plan to wrap it up at 2 o'clock. Then we have one hour for meeting, hopefully a whole year. And then at 3 o'clock, Malta Tourism Authority has set up a sightseeing bus for those of you that want to go on that. So you can bring your wives and so on on that trip as well. And it's a two-hour trip that will bring you around the island to various beautiful places to have a look and then end up in St. Julian's. Yes, so the buses will pick you up here at 3 o'clock in Gloriosa and after two hours approximately you can land in St. Julian's. This morning we also have a couple of changes to the program since Professor Fortin from Olsen University College was taking me. So we shuffle things around a little bit, but we think the program will be very interesting. We will have the extended work break after we get a business from Monsieur Airline, so we have more time to look at the view and enjoy. But other than that, we're on track. So, the first talk for the first interview of the day is actually going to be via Skype to Hawaii, another island, where ours is. Island to island connection, where ours is a time zone difference, so we will be able to connect to Professor Brady Bush. We have, a, we have a very uh, long history with Brady, actually, he, uh, as you may know, he is, uh, if, if, if somebody says open source and they ask uh, for a name to be associated with the probability that Jim Gillespie pops up is very high. If you say software architecture, the name uh, Grady Bush probably pops up with equal probability. Grady uh, was one of the top uh, writers of UML. Uh, it's been active uh, in software engineering and architecture since uh, way, way back. He uh, worked for many years for Rational. Uh, he also worked for IBM as an IBM fellow. And he's written many books uh, and hundreds of articles on the topic. Uh, last year, uh, as soon as Marcel was out, he signed up as a contributor. Um, so he's been uh, actively supporting us and following what's going on. He was definitely going to come last year and he didn't make it. He was definitely going to come this year and he didn't make it because he has another conference conflicting. But we said, okay, we will have to uh, try to connect so we can have a chat with him about what he thinks about the work and the importance of architecture and uh, uh, various other aspects. So we will now try to make a very good question. Hello, Brady. We cannot hear you. Just a moment. It turns out that we can hear you by Skype, but not from you. I don't know if there's going to be any sentence on your side at all. This thing went to the group. How's that now? Now it's better. Can you allow it here now? Ah, excellent. Very good. All right. So can you see me now as well? Yeah, so I see you well. Yeah, so what you see now is a little bit strange because you see the audience in the back, but you should see yourself also on screen. Uh, and uh, yeah, so first of all, thank you very much for connecting. Um, how is it in Hawaii right now? Uh, we had a beautiful evening. It's a, just a lovely, lovely day here. It was around 85 degrees all day, beautiful, clear skies, and they had the first sight of the humpback whales here the other day. So, great time to be in Maui. Yes, well, it sounds like Hawaii is giving us some competition. We are not complaining either. Okay, great. So, um, yes, thank you very much for connecting once again. Um, we have a couple of questions here. Um, uh, appreciate today's uh, great day. Um, 
But there's one thing that we haven't discussed all that much, and we leave it to you because uh, you obviously are the person to definitely uh, talk everything about it. Why focus on architecture? We talk about Marta and how we reference architecture all, all the time, but, but why focus on architecture? Um, is it, wouldn't it simply be enough to just have open interface interface and tutorials? Would that be just it? Well, let's talk about what we mean by architecture and, and see if there is a, a shared understanding of that. Um, the SEI and others have, have proposed a variety of definitions for architecture, and I think many of them are quite sound. But I have a very simplistic operational view of architecture, and that's simply that architecture is the name we give the most significant design decisions in our system. And let me offer that by way of a couple of, of stories in that regard. In a totally different domain, uh, consider Watson system that IBM built to play Jeopardy. I had the privilege of working with the Watson team last year as they were transitioning from the research group over to commercialization. And you can imagine that here you've got a group that's been fiddling with the code base of about two million lines for almost four years, almost five years. And it's a beautiful system, but it's not like they documented lots of things. And now they were about to take this system throw it over the wall, if you were, to several different groups who were about to uh, take the brain, take the, 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 the knowledge that was in Watson associated with Jeopardy and transplant it with a whole new knowledge base, in one case associated with intelligence information, another with medical information, another with legal information. So the question for them as we move to commercialization, how do you preserve the code base that you have in a way that allows you to move to the other domains, how do you build upon it? And the answer is, you make it very clear what the significant design decisions are that shape that system. One of the manifestations of those systems is the set of interfaces and protocols you have, but those interfaces and protocol are a corollary to the architecture. They are not the cause of the architecture. It is very possible to design a system with lots and lots of protocol, lots and lots of layers that you have, lots of interfaces. But unless those are designed intentionally, unless they are designed at the proper places and layers in the system, then you end up with simply a, a big dripping error ball of code that has lots of holes in it. So architecture comes first and the protocols come second because architecture tells you where to draw those lines and define those interfaces. Thank you very much. And that was a great, great answer. So now we talked about openness and again moving on to open architecture. Are open architecture safe or how secure? One could make a case that open architectures are actually more safe than secure. And I'll offer by way of a counterexample. Now what I'm about to say is you know my own personal observation is not necessarily bad. Anybody living or dead is certainly not that of my employer. This is my opinion. But in the news recently, you may have heard of uh, the U.S. government being a little bit testy over some imports by a Chinese telecommunications company. Indeed, uh, the federal government here viewed their imports as a security threat because here they were delivering uh, routers and, and digital switches that would be used in important infrastructure elements throughout the United States. And yet there were very serious concerns that in that proprietary software uh, for either malicious or, or perhaps uh, reasons of incompetence, there may have been um, backdoors put in there. And so in the presence of proprietary software, you have this level of trust you must have about how it works and how it behaves. And the problem becomes even more challenging as you build more and more complex systems. On the other hand, if software is open to all eyeballs, if it is indeed uh, a code base that anyone can look at any time, then you make it very difficult to bring in security challenges like that. There's a, a phrase in the intelligence community speaking of security by obscurity, and as it turns out, that never works. But 
rather shining a light light on the code base you have actually makes it possible, desirable, to build that software in a way that is far more safe than proprietary software. Thank you. All right, so let's say, all right, we can do that. So we're a company that decides to, to, to go and have a open architecture, so open standards. But what happens to the market and, and the competition when the open architecture and open standards enter the marketplace? Um, what would happen, let's say, with the Google Marine Electronics Company, who's currently basing their solutions on proprietary software? Um, will, we, will they lose their competitiveness due to this disruption, or what do you think will happen? That's an excellent question that I think every company who is, is facing this must deal with. And the first reaction I find organizations to face is utter terror, like, oh my god, uh, we're going to be flooded with this software that we never compete with and it's going to destroy our business. However, my experience of the open source marketplace, especially the marketplace of platforms such as what Marsa are all about, is it actually makes the marketplace bigger. And let me offer two examples of that. And by bigger, it actually creates an incredible opportunity for innovation. And I'll just be very frank, an incredible opportunity to make more money. Well, let me explain why. I'll give you two examples why that's the case. I had the opportunity some years ago to work with a shipping company, OOCL. And uh, this was around the time when, long ago in the container business, when there was not a great deal of automation. And that, I don't know, some of you may have been with OOCL or worked with OOCL or might be there for right now. But they had this notion that they could build a framework that would allow them to manage their orders, ship their, handle their shipping, manage down the container level in ways that were far more efficient than they could do before. So we worked with them to, to build architecture systems that could do so. Along the way, their technology officer, Tim G, had this profound idea, he observed that a lot of what they were doing was actually the same kind of thing that everyone other competitors would have to do. Wouldn't it make sense, therefore, if they were to pull out the proprietary bits and then make the domain independent parts available to everyone? And in fact, they did. This is not an open source project. This is way before open source time, but I'll, I'll pivot to an open source example. So what Ken and OOCL did was to say, let's pull this out, let's actually start a company that delivers this platform. I think it's called the Iris, if I'm not mistaken. And in fact, it became an important de facto standard used in most every partner around the world. So here's an example of taking a specific proprietary solution, generalizing it, delivering it to the marketplace, and now others can develop the product. And you, in, in the process, you create a third-party marketplace. The other example, which is truly open source, and I think very germane to, to Mars's world, and in fact, it is the reason it exists is what interested me in, in your work, because I think you guys are doing exactly the same thing as what's happening here, and here I'm speaking of an auto star. So here's the situation. Uh, BMW came out with one of the first heavily electronic software-intensive cars some years ago, and again, this is my opinion, the software interface not really sucked. It was over engineered, it was impossible to use. I had a friend of mine who had one of the early cars and he reported that he was actually locked inside his own vehicle. So happily BMW, you know, they have come a long way to prove. What BMW does BMW real life over the years is that they are in the business of building beautiful, wonderful cars that delight people. They're not a software. So they said, wouldn't it make sense if we helped develop an ecosystem that would allow even our competitors to have a plug and play kind of mechanism that actually simplifies and unifies the marketplace, marketplace with a standard architecture, software and hardware down to the connector level for in car electronics? Thus was born AutoSAR. And AutoSAR itself, its architecture, is fully open. So here you have an example that I think is a wonderful contrast because most of the European and Japanese car companies that have embraced this, where you are seeing tremendous economic value come to the participants of AutoSAR because now they don't have to 
build the same things over and over again, but they can work about their unique value add on top of this framework. And that's exactly what I think is happening with Mars. So you guys are a classic example of the beginnings of an ecosystem that can help make their markets local. And by participating in the mid Pacific now, by, by hammering out what the key architectural decisions are, you are in fact ensuring a platform that you can build upon for decades. The last part of comment I'd make on this topic is consider the place Microsoft once had in the world. There was a time in the world where we cared very much about the microprocessors we would choose. In the earliest days with the you know, 68,000 versus the Intel, et cetera, et cetera, the battle was down to the hardware level. But then the battle shifted. Operating system level. It was Windows versus OS2 versus all the other early players. And eventually a dominant player emerged. But you don't hear much about the operating system wars because they don't matter as much anymore. We've really moved up to a higher level of abstraction, and now it's the web as the platform, and we're building on top of that. But what's happening even in the web is we are seeing the formation of these domain specific architectural ecosystems around which whole business is built. Uh, look at, for example, um, uh, people's stuff and uh, Amazon, for that matter. In fact, Amazon did a brilliant architectural move in that they made everything a service, and that enabled their uh, their cloud services, the Amazon, uh, Amazon uh, stores, and all that. So what you're doing, you are going down the path that others have done and I think you'll find that it leads to a better marketplace for all of you, and a place where you can now focus on really interesting, innovative ideas on top of that platform. Thank you, sir, for the excellent example. I would definitely try out this to learn from that. Great, you just touched upon this one also um, about you know, marketplace uh, domain. Um, but what do you think will happen to innovation in the marketplace sector? Um, how marketplace folks can impact innovation in this? Sector, so talk about the main specific and the very important factor. Sure. Well, one thing I should say at the beginning here is that you know I followed your work for some time, really since the beginning, and I, I've admired what you're doing. Uh, please know that I or IBM have no fiduciary interest in what you're doing. I just think from a professional perspective, you guys are doing the wrong right thing. So I just want to celebrate that. But as for the maritime sector, let me say personally, I am becoming more and more attuned to that marketplace. Having lived in the landlocked area of Colorado, which was some 1,500 miles away from any, any navigable ocean, and now here I am living in Maui, and uh, the notion of marine life is, is far more in my face every day. What, what strikes me as I now begin to use the here is that there is the beginning of a renaissance in that domain, uh, the discovery of the power of software intensive systems. You're not quite the place where I think the, uh, uh, the automotive industry is. Um, I think there are certainly lots of things that we've learned from what has happened in the defense sector. We, we talk about the high degree of, of automation. Most of Navy's battleships these days are basically computers and armor, that's sort of how we describe it. And you're in a world, you all are in a world, where certainly the, the cost factor of software systems in the ships and boats you deliver is a small or a growing percentage of what you do. And I think that there are some fascinating opportunities for what one can do to deliver new services uh, to your customers that simply you could not have thought of before. In fact, with the presence of the Marsa Foundation, it, it helps you in the sense that you don't have to invest the money to do that yourself. You can start at a higher level of abstraction. And so, for me, you know, dream about what can be done. Is it, I think about just the container industry, which is where I have some experience base. I'm in mean, the presence of being able to put uh, low-cost GPS centers down at the container level has just changed the business. We're seeing that happen in the rail industry as well. You guys are the dreamers and visionaries, but I can just simply tell you that from my experience in other domains, at the point in time where the cost of delivering software-intensive systems comes to the place where you now have a platform upon which you can build and play in the marketplace, then there's the opportunity for a thousand flowers to bloom, and you all are the ones to make that happen. Thank you very much, so much for
Ireland. <laughs> so it's hard to actually answer the audience question, what do you think about the, the Mars initiative and the approach? So if you'd like to add anything to that, but uh, I think it rocks. Yes. <laughs> right, thank you so much. Now um, do we have any questions from, from the audience?
and those conditions in line decisions. And I'm a great fan of proof of work plus one model view. In fact, if you ask nicely, uh, I'll send you to all the uh, the slide that we did for the IBM Watson Mark Little Let's Go Dig, and it shows you an example of those four of those five views. But there's another sub lesson that you get to do once you really start having a, a well founded architecture, and that's the world of patterns. So you may have looked at patterns, you may have you know, seen people with the book design patterns on, on, on their desk. But there's another thing that we find in well structured architectures that pops up. And that is this wonderful texture of common ways of solving common problems that cut across multiple views. So with, with the view notion I, I pointed to the leaf's paper with patterns, I urge you to take a look at the hillside view. Hillside.org is the name of it. And you can find more than you ever want to know about patterns. But it, it, as you advance in your understanding of architecture, then those are two places you can manage to find yourself in. And I'm a big believer in both of those as foundations of good architecture. So the, the second topic, and this is something completely different. Um, I, I have this is really a delicious opportunity at IBM as a fellow uh, to do a variety of things. In fact, when I was made a fellow, um, Nick D'Onofrio said, great, you've got uh, two job responsibilities at, at IBM. The first is to invent the future, and that's, that's pretty cool. You know, I get paid for it, too. That's, that's pretty cool. And he said, the second thing is, you need to help destroy bureaucracy. And that's pretty cool, too, because as you might imagine, IBM is part of rich environment, that kind of thing. So I get to do a, a lot of fun things. A lot of what I do uh, from a technical perspective is I do architecture things like this, and I work with the customers to help them with their architecture. But as a fellow, I've been given tremendous degrees of freedom to go off and do things that I think are right and sound and good for the industry at large. And to that end, you're, I'm going to tell you about something that few people know about publicly, so you're one of the first to know about it. Those of you who are older may have heard of or seen Carl Sagan's Cosmos, that was a delightful series on PBS and that he broadcast on the BBC 20 years ago, in which over 13 episodes, Sagan is really explored the wonders of the universe. Well, I'm with my wife and the Computer History Museum in Mountain View, California, are currently working on a multi-part documentary for public TV on computing. Um, here I am as an insider. I decided that now was the time in my career that I want to open the curtain to the general public on what computing is and what its possibilities are. So we're going to be covering topics such as the coevolution of computing and war, uh, life and death, uh, computing as it relates to, to poverty and, and wealth, and even issues of how does computing impact <coughs> human experience relative to what are we as humans, especially if we build systems that uh, give the illusion of sentience. And as it turns out, your world, in the marine world, is such a classic example of the renaissance that's going in computing that we want to you know, open the curtain uh, to the general public on this. The curious thing about us versus, say, what Sagan's world has done on is in the world of astrophysics, physicists, and physicists, they look at this beautiful complexity of the universe and try to tease apart that complexity and identify the, the small, simple rules that define all of it. We in the software world do exactly the opposite. We start with very, very simple laws. Uh, the notion of Turing complete machines and the languages upon them. We bottle them up in millions upon millions of lines of code. And then we make them disappear. The most interesting technology is invisible to the world. So we do exactly the opposite of what the physicists so I am on a journey here to, uh, to help open that curtain and explain some of the mystery and, and hopefully you know, encourage people to think about how the use of computing in a responsible and ethical way. So just kind of a heads up that you're going to be hearing more about it because that's where my focus is over the coming years. Sounds fantastic. We're really looking forward to it. Very, very excited about it. Okay, so thank you very much, Grady. Um, we we'll wish you a nice evening. Michelle, it's uh, time enough for me to take a walk on the beach yet. <laughs> yes, please do so. <laughs> We're going on to the living room. Much appreciated. It was great. See you later. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much. Uh, Bye. Bye.
that was uh, interesting I think it was for that uh, in reality lifestyle and it's not only uh, emo artwork in here uh, and all that uh, that's been core so far that we have supporters of all calibers uh, we have this we know that there are many people uh, that we don't even know about that this is they, 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 we can see more and contributors uh, no long uh, looking at what we're doing and we can see contributors who do think that we allow that because we want people to have an opportunity to make their own opinion and to learn how they can uh, engage and we are sure that the values arrive more and more people from all parts of the world come out and support the device and make 